Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We have a fantastic webinar for you uh, with special guest Kathleen Fitzgerald, Chicago Booth professor and SEMA expert. Uh, Kathleen will be highlighting the SEMA curriculum and discussing equity valuation. Um, I'm gonna briefly cover who we are, the Investments in Wealth Institute, and some housekeeping things as we get started. Uh, my colleague Gray Bullard is on the line and I am Carrie Estes. We are enrollment counselors here at the Investments and Wealth Institute. Our role is to talk with advisors, um, work out their education goals, and how our certification programs and education can be of value. Today's webinar, we are on a Zoom call. All lines are muted. If you do have any questions, please go ahead and put those into the chat function. We will get to those at the end of today's presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be provided to you um, after we wrap up today. And no CE hours awarded for today's informational webinar. So who are we? We are the Investments and Wealth Institute. There are certifications, conferences, online education courses. Our mission is to deliver that premier investment consulting and wealth management credentials, as, long, as well as world-class education. Both individuals and firms turn to us for those professional development needs. Here's kind of a cool infographic we like to show. Of course, we are best known for those three certifications. SEMA, which of course we're highlighting today, our CPWA, our Certified Private Wealth Advisor, focusing on wealth management um, and high net worth individuals and families. And then the RMA, Retirement Income Planning, um, the Retirement Management Advisor, focusing on that retirement income planning. We put on some cool um, industry events like Women in Wealth and Diversity Elevates and have live conferences. So at our core, we are a trade association and education provider and standards body for financial advisors. This is kind of the who, what, where, why, and when of the SEMA program for financial advisors, investment consultants, analysts, wealth management professionals. We pride ourselves in being that peak international portfolio construction designation, and you can earn the SEMA through Chicago Booth School of Business and Yale University, and then that why, how to differentiate yourself, earn higher compensation, um, get for that expert instruction through Chicago Booth or Yale, and of course, relevant content. Um, and then the when, right now, um, we think, you know, earning advanced education and a credential uh, really does a lot for your practice um, and your professional development. So feel free to reach out to Gray or myself. We'd love to hear more about that when and when it's right for you. Here's a core curriculum of the SEMA program. Kathleen's gonna highlight this um, as we move through the presentation, but you can see at a high level, we have five pillars of the SEMA, fundamentals, investments, portfolio theory and behavioral finance, risk and return, and that portfolio construction and consulting process. We have what we call the detailed content outline. Um, I believe it's the best place to start for any candidate looking at the program. It dives deep into, the, into what to expect in the SEMA curriculum. Gray and I would be happy to pass that along if you want to reach out after today's call. So here's a quick look at our three education providers. I will mention Wharton is currently taking a pause um, from their educational offerings in 2022. Um, but Yale is going to offer a fully on-demand course, and um, University of Chicago has more of a hybrid type model. You can see pricing there, and again, Greg and I would be happy to walk through which format is best for you and your, and your learning style. So let's get to it. Um, why you're here today to hear from the fantastic Kathleen Fitzgerald. Kathleen is a SEMA Chicago Booth professor and our guru of all things SEMA. Um, so we are so lucky to have you, Kathleen. I appreciate you joining us today and we'll let you take over. Oh, I think you're still on mute there. There All we right. go. I will stop. I should know better by now. How's everyone doing this morning? Can you write something in the chat? Like what city you're in? Just so I can, while I set up my screen. Does everyone have chat access? New Jersey, Chicago. Oh, Monica. Monica's a team player. All over the place. Oh, hey, Audrey. Nice. It's good to find um, SEMA people that want to do the SEMA in your city, because then you can study together. So at Booth, we try to get you in study groups so that 
you can learn. I know, you know, you, sometimes it's hard to commit to being in a study group, but on the other hand, I think you learn a lot more when you can say these things outside. So I don't know if you know, if you just randomly came on this or not, or you've been part of the program, um, IWI has set up this whole series of kind of short, short lectures. They're really more like teasers on some of the topics that are on the exam. Today, we're gonna to do equity valuation. But before we get started, um, I wanna talk a little bit about the SEMA curriculum. Um, to me, it's, it's, it's an excellent curriculum. So the way that it's set up is, first of all, they, you get the foundations. So the foundations are the things that you're gonna need for the rest of the program. So the exam has these five areas. One is foundations. And in the foundations, we talk about stats, probability, time value of money, micro, macro, and a little bit about capital markets history so you can get an understanding of what's gone on in the past. Any of you that have done a business degree or even if you're in the MBA program, um, this is kind of like also the core curriculum for an MBA program, right? And then of course you would do a bunch of electives, but on the investment side. Once we know the foundations, then we move to, you know, what types of things can you invest in? And this is the area where you learn about different types of investment vehicles. So this could be like um, mutual funds, ETFs, hedge funds, SMAs, unit investment trusts, these types of things. And you learn the different um, characteristics um, of these different vehicles, what are the tax issues, what are the risks, what are the correlations. And then we also learn about kind of what goes into these investment vehicles. So whether it's stocks, bonds, alternatives. What are some examples of alternatives? What would you write? Write something in the chat. What would you say as an example? Art, commodities, yeah, energy, anything like that. I would say that hedge funds and PE and all of those are also alternatives, but they're in several characters. Several categories as well, I agree. Um, venture capital. So we're gonna learn a lot about those characteristics and what are the qualifications to be able to invest in those. We'll, they spend some time on option futures and other derivatives and on real assets. So we learn the foundation so we can learn the, the tools that we need to be able to price things and understand supply and demand and inflation. Then we understand the investments, and then we think about, well, how do we put these things into portfolios? So we spend time on modern portfolio theory, really, um, different types of models. We might learn also CAPM here, which is not a portfolio theory, but it is an asset pricing model. Then then we think about, well, behavioral finance is another lens. Um, tools and strategies, we talk in here about technical analysis as well. And then different types of investment philosophies and styles, like goals based, for example, cash flow based, um, dynamic, static, all different ways that you might think about investments. So you have your foundations, you know how to price things, you know what investments you can make, you know the theory and you know, diversification, how to put these things into portfolios. You are aware of different types of biases that you may have um different styles and then we want to measure well how well that we did so the next section on this exam is about risk and return measures so what are different ways to measure risk default risk systematic risk total risk liquidity risk reinvestment risk um different risk measures and different ways to measure return geometric return internal rate of return holding period return capital gain um uh, income yield, all of these types of things. So, you know, sigma, beta, default, holding period return, IRR, time weighted, geometric, arithmetic, all different ways of measuring returns so that you can interpret the return data that you get and also explain things to clients. 
And then we do performance measurement. So normally relative to some benchmark, whether it's the asset cap M or another, an index or something like that. So we learn about alpha, information ratios, sharp, M squared. Um, we learn about attribution, R squared, attribution is here. Um, all different ways of measuring our performance. And then finally, we put it all together in what, you know, the whole, de the whole, the whole degree, I almost called it a degree, kind of like a degree, right? Looks like a degree program. Um, you have a certification. Um, and so what is it all? Let's put it all together. So we think about as a SEMA representative or a member, what is the code of professional responsibility? So that's key. Uh, you know, ethics, practices, discipline, I won't write that down, um, but disciplinary, right? Got to stick to the rules. Um, client discovery. Then we think about the whole consulting. This is more about the consulting process. This is how you conduct yourself in these things that you do. So how do you learn more about the client? Investment policy and investment policy statements. The actual mechanics of putting together your portfolio. How do you find and select <laughs> managers for these products that you're putting into your portfolios? And then once you have them, how do you review them? When do you review them? How do you revise, right? Do you have um, rebalancing? Do you not rebalance? Uh, do you do this every month, every year? What are all these things? So they're all laid out in the investment policy statement. But to me, this is very comprehensive, right? And if you're learning to get, if you really want to have a broad understanding of your industry and also a deep un understanding, so this gives you kind of breadth and depth. Um, I think it's a wonderful addition to your portfolio. Is that clear to you? Does that make sense? Does that make you want to do it? Makes me want to do it. You can write yes or no in the chat. Then I'll feel like you hear me. Good answer, Richard. Yeah. So today our focus is on equity valuation. And you know, you may not traditionally think of this as an investments topic. If you are in an um, MBA program, for example, you would probably do this in corporate finance. However, it has become more and more part of the program. Um, and it makes sense that it would because one of the things you're asking people to invest in is equity, right? And this equity is from firms. So if you don't know how equity is valued, then you kind of just stop with, well, this is the price, right? And so it's important to get an understanding of how it is equity valued. And so since we're doing that, I think we should think about in general, what's the goal of the firm? So if I asked you, what's the goal of the firm? You're running a big public company. What would be your goal? What are some goals that you might have? What would you try to do? I might pick on Audrey. Yeah, we want to, perfect. Maximize current shareholder value. That's the goal. So how do we measure shareholder value? It is the price per share times the number of shares outstanding. Okay. Um, earnings per share <clears throat> can be influenced by repurchasing shares and things like that. So we don't worry too much. We, we like, Gray, when we um, present our financial statements and we talk about things, we want earnings per share to be growing and they definitely care about those things. But if we take a step back to like finance, our goal is to maximize current shareholder value. Like the shares outstanding, if this is the value of the firm, does it really matter if it's two shares or four or six or eight? Not really. There's not a lot of 
movement here. So what we really care about is where the price per share comes from. And so how do we decide what the price per share is? So there's lots of ways to do it, but mainly the price of anything will equal the present value. And we did a present value, we did time value money last time of expected future cash flows. Attributed to that, attributed to whatever we're valuing. So if I want to value the firm, then I'm going to look at cash flows generated by the firm. If I want to value debt, I'm going to look at the cash flows for debt, so the coupon rate, the coupon payment, and the principal. If I want to value equity, then I'm going to look at the cash flows for equity holders. If I want to value a project, then I'm going to look at the incremental cash flows um, uh, attributed to the product project. So cash flows we would have with the project that we wouldn't have without the project. And so time value money is very important. In fact, we need three things. So if I were to do this, I would say, and it's really the sum of, it's the sum of expected free cash flows. And we'll talk about which free cash flows later brought back in time. And so we need three things. We need one, we need time value of money math skills. That's trivial for you guys. Two, we need expected free cash flows. So we need to think about where do we get those cash flows? And number three, we need a discount rate. And that discount rate is the rate that we bring that money back in time with, right? So we need the discount rate, we need the free cash flows, and we need to be able to have foundational and fundamental skills on math, right? So if that's true, and if that's price, then, you know, let's look at Starbucks, for example. What's going on with, this is their price as of May 2nd, probably lower now. But what go, this is their market cap up here. So this is price and number of shares. This is the price per share. And this is the number of shares outstanding. So what's going on with their price? Does it stay constant? No, right? It changes all the time. What happened here? <clears throat> Why did they think the price dropped to about 50 bucks in March of 2020? Yeah, pandemic. Thanks, Greg. COVID, right? The day that COVID came out, like when it really got bad. So if we think back here, if we think of the sum of expected free cash flows, what happened? What do you think people thought about free cash flows? Do you think they thought they were going to go up or down once everything started getting shut down? Yeah, free cash flows started going down. And our expectation, right? We thought, oh, that's bad. And so if that's the formula and expected free cash flows are supposed to go down, then we would expect price to go down. Also, this discount rate, in general, this, risk, this discount rate is a risk-free rate plus a risk premium. And this risk premium is the additional amount that we require to invest in risky assets, you know, like a not a treasury bond. So what do you think people thought about risk when COVID was happening? We didn't know what was going on. You think that risk premium went up or down? Yeah, people got more, you know, they're like, oh, we better hold on to our money. We don't even know if we're gonna have a job, right? Let's like lock this in. And so when the denominator goes up, what happens to price? Price also goes down, right? So a couple of things were happening there in, in 2020. But then, you know, people started to realize, oh, Starbucks has it together. Things aren't as bad as we thought. And the price started rising again. Um, and then lately, 
the price has started falling again. But why does price change? It changes because of either the cash flows or the discount rate. It's not changing because of math, right? And you know, it could change because of inflation. What's in the risk-free rate? The risk-free rate is a nominal rate. So it's also equal to the real rate plus expected inflation. So if expected inflation is expected to go up, you know, if inflation goes up, sometimes the free cash flows also go up. Maybe they just go up a little bit and maybe the price also goes down, but it could go up. I mean, it depends. Investing in stocks during inflationary periods is not always a bad idea, right? Because they can just change their prices, right? So they incorporate that inflation in price, but which one dominates, it depends. We'll, we could see. Does everyone understand that? So one of the things and one of the styles that you'll learn in SEMA is how to think about these things, right? If you know the fundamentals, you can say, oh, to your clients, yep, yeah, you can talk about this, you can talk about that, you can talk about inflation and then explain, you know, why, why equities might be a good hedge for inflation or why not? <laughs> so how do we estimate the share price? There's lots of different ways. The main way is discounted cash flows. So we could, we could take the value of the firm. We could say the value of the firm is the sum of the expected free cash flows to the firm. Bring that back in time, subtract the value of the debt, get the value of the equity, divide by the number of shares and come up with a price. We could just also value the equity directly. We could say the value of the equity is the sum of the expected free cash flows to equity holders brought back in time, let's say at an equity cost of capital and then divide by the number of shares and come up with a price per share. Most people do the former, by the way, not the latter. <coughs> and then, we could use a discounted dividend model where we would say the price today is the dividend next period brought back in time. This was a present value of a perpetuity, which we talked about last week. We'll talk about it again. Um, some people even more back of the envelope might use a price to earnings ratio, right? Like if the industry PE is 15 and our earnings per share equals two, then we would say, oh, our price should be $30, right? You could do something like that. Um, you better make sure you have the right comp firms if you're doing that, by the way. We could use a market to book ratio, market value of equity over book value of equity, some multiple of that. Um, we won't cover it today, but, but it's the same thing. It's PE ratios just multiplied by number of shares. It's like, P times number of shares, E times number of shares. It's, it's the same thing. It's just that a, a growth measure instead of a per share measure. And then one other thing that I've noticed in testing is Tobin's Q. The Tobin's Q is not really a way to price shares, but it's a way that some people use to determine whether shares are over or undervalued, right? So Tobin's Q is like, um, the market value of asset equity over the book value of net assets, where net assets are assets minus liability. So they say, if that's greater than one, then they're overvalued. I'm not a big fan. Um, I think it might work for some industries, but not for others. Um, but you should still know what it is because people talk about it all the time and you could be tested on it. So that's important. So let's just think about discounted cash flows. Are we all on track? Is everything making sense, by the way? Can you, I'm doing a wellness check here. Are you all right? <laughs> Tracking? Okay. Always interject if you have a question, okay? All right. 
So we said we needed three things, time value, cash flows, and discount rate, right? And we can value the firm. We can value the equity. We can value the debt. We could value a project. Um, so we have time value money math, cash flows, and discount rates. So time value money math we did before. Um, you know, value of a lump sum, value of a perpetuity with or without growth. If growth is with no growth, G is zero. And the value of an annuity. So a lump sum is just like a single payment, $10,000 one year from now. If the, if the discount rate is 10%, then it's worth like 90, 90, 91 today. Um, a perpetuity is an equal payment, equally spaced in time that goes on forever. So if it's like 100, 105, 110, 25, my growth rate is five. My discount rate, my cost of capital is 10. So the value is 100 over 0 0.10 minus 0 0.05. So that would be, you know, $2,000. If it's an annuity, it's an equal payment, equally spaced in time that goes on for three, a number of a certain number of periods. So here I would say, you know, N equals three, payment is 100, future value is zero. My interest rate, let's keep it at 10%. If I did that, it's probably worth around 240, but let me just tell you what it is, just so we have the number there in case you wanna check it later. Two forty eight. Right. So all of these are telling you what the present value tells you is in the first case, <clears throat> if I earn 10% of my money this year, for me to have 10,000 at the end of the year, I need $9,091 now. The perpetuity with the growth says, if I want a, a payment that's $100 next year and growing at 5% a year, I need $2,000 today. And that would satisfy that. You could use that for retirement endowment, right? What, in our case today, we're gonna to use it for valuation. An annuity is an equal payment equally spaced in time. If I think that I need $50,000 a year or $100,000 a year to live for 15 years, how much do I need to have in my retirement account if I'm earning at 10% and expect to live X number of years, right? So all of this we use in many, many ways, but we're gonna use it today for valuation. So time value money math, straightforward. Cash flows, which cash flows do we use? We have to use the cash flows that go with the thing that we're valuing. So with debt, principal, coupon, equity, free cash flows that belong to the equity holders. That means after the debt holders and preferred stock shareholders have been satisfied. To the firm, what are the cash flows generated by the company? And to the project, incremental cash flow, right? Present value or price or value. The sum of expected free cash flows, depending on which they are, brought back in time. So we're on the numerator. Which cash flows go on the numerator? The math we can do. Here's more on the cash flows. So we're not gonna go all through it, but these would be the cash flows to the firm. So generated by the firm or the assets of the company. And these are the free cash flows to the equity holders. These are approximately, you know, the cash we earn in operations plus the cash from investing, whatever investing we need to make um, approximately because it doesn't include interest. Interest is down here. So if you want to know more about corporate finance, 
you would understand these a little bit better. We'll talk about it more in class. For today, I just want to generate the broad picture because it's a teaser. Um, so those are the cash flows we do when we want to value the firm. And these are the cash flows when we want to value the equity directly. Everyone clear? Are we good? Anyone take corporate finance out there? Yes, so you would have done that, yeah. It, it's not hard, it's easy, but I just, for now, we're just thinking about what the input would be. So then the main question, and we'll do a lot of this in class, is which discount rate to use, right? How do we know what to put in the denominator? Well, we need to use the discount rate that reflects the risk of the cash flows in the numerator. They have to match. So if I'm going to value debt, then I use the cost of debt. I'll call it the opportunity cost of debt. It's, the, uh, it's what the investor could earn on an equally risky debt investment over the same time horizon, right? So if Mario is issuing debt and I'm issuing debt and our firms are equally risky, right? And it's the same term structure, same everything, then we should really be giving the same, my opportunity cost of debt is his cost of debt and vice versa, right? So that's cost of debt. If we're gonna use equity, then we want the opportunity cost of equity. If we wanna value the firm, we can either use the cost of assets or we can use a weighted average cost of capital. A weighted average cost of capital is a weight based on how much debt and equity we have in the company. And we would use the same for a project. Have you heard of WAC, weighted average cost of capital? That's what it's called, weighted average cost of capital. Like if you think of a balance sheet, balance sheet says assets equals liabilities plus shareholders equity, and we'll make it debt. Assets equals debt plus shareholders equity. Well, it's also true that the value of the asset equals the value of the debt plus the value of the equity, right? So in some ways, you know, we decide we can discount the cash flows to the assets using RA, or we could use some weighted average cost of capital, depending on how our firm is financed. Yeah. So we could do that. I'll show you how that's done. But where do the R's come from? Like, how do we decide what's the cost of debt, the cost of equity, the cost of assets, right? Well, we can use the capital asset pricing model. So what the CAPM says is the expected return on an asset, the thing that you need to return to the investors equals the risk-free rate. We have to at least give people what they could earn on a certain investment with no volatility plus what I said before, the risk premium. Now, what is this risk premium? It is some function of the market risk premium. So the market risk premium is kind of like our benchmark. And if our risk premium should be higher then our beta will be higher than one. The beta of the market is one. And we'll talk about why that is. Um, but if my beta is 1.5, then I'm gonna have to have a higher market risk premium. They're gonna be charged more. And so the market risk premium is just the difference between what the market overall is expected to earn over the risk-free rate. So if I told you that the risk-free rate was two, the market risk premium is six and your beta, it'll be my beta, is 1.5, well, what would I have to pay? What would be my cost of capital? It would be two plus 1.5 times six or 11%. Okay. Um, 
Now, what is I? I could be assets. We would have assets and beta assets. We could have equity and beta equity. We could have debt and beta debt, right? So what is beta? It's a measure of systematic risk, non-diversifiable. Since we can't diversify it, we need to be paid to take it on. Okay, that's the whole point. So beta tells us how many units of risk we have. And then the market risk premium tells us the price of that risk. So for example, in our example, if we had beta here and expected return here, We've got our risk-free rate there of two. Remember the market, market has a beta of one. So the, um, the market return is eight, right? Because they have a risk premium of six. And us at 1.5 or me, I have an expected return of 11. Oh, shoot, I hate when I do that. Because my risk premium is 1.5 times the market or 9%. I need to earn 9% over the risk-free rate. If instead I was at 0 0.5, then I would only have to earn a risk premium of three and that would be five, right? So this is all the cap M. Application of the cap M is very easy. Getting the numbers is not that easy, right? Is that clear to you how we might come up with a cost of capital? Do you understand? Great. So, you know, the discount rate, we would either use, <clears throat> you know, RA is RF plus the asset beta times the market risk premium. RE is RF plus equity beta times the market risk premium. RD is RF plus the debt beta times the market risk premium. We could do that, no problem. Some people like to use a weighted average cost of capital. The weighted average cost of capital says let's use the after-tax cost of debt times the percentage of the firm finance with debt plus the cost of equity times the percentage of the firm finance with equity. So they're just weighting it, but it's the same topic, same idea. Companies use this a lot for valuation. We use the after-tax cost of debt because interest expense is tax deductible. Okay, so that's a weighted average cost of capital. And people, companies internally often use it as a hurdle rate to say to their employees, don't bring us any projects that don't earn us at least our weighted average cost of capital. Okay, so that's just there for input. So let's see an example. So for example, this could be Starbucks. And how, what would be our process? Our process would be you forecast the cash flows maybe for the next five years. Then you would have to use some type of terminal value to capture everything after year five. So this is probably 186, 262 would be the cash flow we expected in period six over R minus U. We would always use a perpetuity to come up with what's called the terminal value. You add up all the cash flows, you get all the cash flows, you bring them back in time using present value is future value. And then you add them up. That would be the value of the firm. Let's say we have no excess cash. We've got 1.15 billion shares outstanding, gives us a price per share of 111. So I was kind of approximating the Starbucks example from before. You'll have to have assumptions on the discount rate and so this would be like our WAC, for example. Um, 
what your cash flows are going to grow at in the end and what my cash flows are growing at from period to period. And of course, once I have the value of the firm, I would subtract the value of the debt and then I would divide that by the number of shares to come up with a price. And then these things here are kind of like varying the assumptions. So this is what people do, right? And this is fundamental analysis. And like Warren Buffett and them, right? Trying to figure out by looking at the cash flows what the equity should be worth. If it's trading for more, then short it. If it's trading for less, then buy it. Uh, well, the thing is, Joel, um, the terminal growth rate, you gotta be careful because you can see most of the value comes in the terminal value. Most companies, most people will just go out until we get to steady state and then have those cash flows grow with inflation, right? So once we get to like where we think they're growing at a constant rate, then we use the terminal value. Because if you have it too high, it's just out of whack. You see what I'm saying? So I think most people assume inflation. Yeah. Or if you have some sustainable competitive advantage that would allow you to grow at a rate higher than inflation, um, then you could use that. But I would, I would probably not. You're, in, you're wrong anyway, so you might as well have it grow with inflation. Here's an example off the web of them trying to do Starbucks as well. You can see that practically speaking, everyone does the same thing. So for example, what if I, I instead want to value the equity directly? Right? So remember, th this one here is value of the firm and then value the equity by subtracting the value of the debt. I'm just writing it here. Cause we'll give you these slides if you're interested. Um, okay, so we know that last year we had free cash flows of equity of 4.5 million and has, we have 2.25 million shares outstanding. Our required return on equity is 10 and our WAC is 8.2. If I want to value the equity, which one should I use? RE or WAC? What would you use if I want to value equity? We would use RE. Right, we would use 10%. And if we, um, our cash flows are growing at 8% and we had 4.5 million last year, what will be next year's free cash flows? So if I want to value the firm or value the equity, it would be the sum of the expected low well, in this particular case. Expected free cash flows to equity over our E minus G, right? And so I can do it on the that's at the gross level. I could do it also at the per price level. And since they're asking for one share, I guess I'll do it by share. So last year, what were my, what was my free cash flow per share? 4.5 over 2.25 is $2 of free cash flows to equity per share. So next year, it should be 216, right? Which is the same thing as what Paul wrote, but I did it on a per share basis. So what would be the price of equity? It would be $2.16 over 10% minus 8%. So 
So that's like multiplying it by 50? 108. That's how you would come up with a per share price using free cash flows to equity. But instead we might use the discounted dividend model that we talked about. So the discounted dividend model is doing things by shares. So if I told you that next period dividend was gonna be $3, my cost of capital is 10%, my growth rate is 3%, the discounted dividend model would say today's price is next year's dividend over 0.07 or $42.85. Okay. Everyone see that? Remember, the price today is always the cash flow next period. So I need next period cash flow. Carrie, when I only have five minutes left, will you write you have five minutes in the chat? Sorry. Certainly, I will remind you. Thank you. Okay, so discounted dividends model is something you would be expected to do on the SEMA exam, right? Another thing that I could do is I could say, um, okay, the price is $20. And next year's dividend is $2. And the discount rate is 15%. And then they might ask you, what's the expected growth in those dividends? And what would you say? What would be the expected growth? You would have to solve for it, right? You have to remember your algebra if you're gonna do the certification exam. We have a math basics thing that you can use to practice, but what's G everybody? What do I know? Two has to be divided by what to be $20? Two has to be multiplied by 10, which means it has to be divided by 10%, which means that our growth rate has to be 5%. So you'll wanna be able to, we'll do this in foundation, but you wanna be able to solve for things like this. Great. So I put some extra practice problems in here that you can do. We'll, we'll give you the solutions. Um, but I want to talk about PE ratios for a sec, because people use those as well. So with a PE ratio, what is that really? Well, if we think about price being equal to earnings, like that. We could also think of the price of something. If you think about the fact that earnings, cash flows do come out of earnings, right? You could do that. So PE really is earnings over R minus G over earnings, which is basically one over R minus G. So PE ratios, you take earnings and capitalize them. And the capitalization rate is one over R minus G. You may not think about it that way because you are just multiplying by price, but that's what that is. It's one over R minus G. So it's basically assuming that your earnings are growing at a perpetual rate, okay? So if the average PE multiple in the oil industry is 22, and we think that earnings are gonna be $1.50, then, What would we say? 1.5 times 22. Or $33. Very good. So let's look at this problem here. And then, we'll, then I promise to finish. So if I, this is a comprehensive problem because it gets everything into it. So if my book value of equity is $50 and I return 8%, then my earnings per share should be $4, do you agree? So 
if my earnings aren't going to grow and my cost of equity is 10%, then what should be my price? My price is four over R minus G, $40. My PE ratio is 40 over four, which is 10, but it's also one over R minus G, which is one over 0 0.10, which is also equal to 10. So I'm just showing you how PE ratios are really just that. Now, the plowback ratio is reinvested. So I didn't tell you where G comes from. So G equals earnings per share, well, earnings per share, actually ROE, times the plowback ratio. This is the earnings we put back in the firm for reinvestment. So if I'm earning 8% on my, on my equity and I'm plowing back 60% of that, then my growth rate is 0.048. So now what is the price? The price would be, um, we've got to figure out what our dividends are. Our dividends, let's use the dividends model. If I, Dividend means I pay 40% in dividends. I retain 60%. So my dividends will be four times 0.4, which is 1.6. Here, dividends equal four because I don't retain, because I pay it all out. So now what are my dividends? My dividends are 160 because I'm not paying it all out. I'm keeping 60% in the firm. So now if I want to know the price, I would say it's $1.60 times 0 0.10 minus 0 0.048. And now my price is only 30.77. Why is my price lower now? This is a case where growth is bad because my price is going to be lower because my return on equity here is only eight and I'm paying 10. So I'm paying 10 to earn 8%. That's not good. That's not good at all, right? So this is a case where growth is bad this one here, this will be the case where growth is good. Right, so if my ROE, I just need to admit, if my ROE is 12% and my book value of equity is 50, now I'm paying out, my earnings per share is $6. My price, is $60. If my plowback again is 60, then my growth rate is 12% times 0.6, which is 0.072. My dividends are six times, um, how much am I paying as dividends? Times 0.4, is that right? 240. Now let's see what our price is. So our price is 240 over 0 0.10 minus 0 0.072. Let's see what that price is. Eighty-five seventy-one. So now growth is good. And that's what the Gordon growth model is. So I know this is a lot to take in, but 
let's just remember what the whole idea is. There's Tobin's cue. So the idea is that <clears throat> this is about equity valuation. We can use it using discounted cash flows or implicit versions of discounted cash flows, such as PE multiples. So discounted cash flows, we value the firm, we subtract the debt, we get the value of the equity, or we could just value the equity, or we could use a discounted dividend model. Okay, so all of the things that we talked about here, <clears throat> we're gonna be doing, right? So where are we hitting it? Time value of money. We'll have to think about probability. We'll have to think about pricing equity or fixed income if we're doing that, right? We'll have to be able to calculate betas and how to measure returns. And all of these things are kind of all woven in together into this idea of equity valuation. So I know I'm not allowed to go on any further on that. I just wanna point out real quickly that our SEMA program, we have one coming up in the fall. And like Carrie said, um, the hybrid. Um, so we do weekly sessions with me every Wednesday night. We also have online videos on, on demand. We've got a live workshop where everyone comes. If you can't come, then you can do it online. Um, and then these are the dates. I always forget to tell. You know, uh, there are two programs in 2022. There's us and Yale. They're, they're not the same. And you should choose. You should work with Carrie and Gray and the others to pick the program that works the best for you to your access to your lifestyle. Obviously, we want you to come to Booth. But more importantly, we want you to learn in the way that is good for you. Okay? Um, so they are experts at helping you decipher what would work for you. And, um, you know, we hope that, we hope you'll do the certification exam no matter where you do it. I think it's really beneficial and I think it's a great opportunity to really shore up your knowledge, meet new people and think about other ways of doing business. Yeah, so That's we'll see you next time, I hope. I don't, our, I don't know what our next one is. What are we doing next time? Oh, risk and return. Yeah, in July. Okay, sorry. So I went on too long. Go ahead. No, Karen. Kathleen, that was fantastic. I think everyone on today's webinar gets a taste of what it's like to go through the um, Chicago booth SEMA experience. Except for we go more slowly. Yeah. <laughs> slowly. We are limited to a certain time today on our yeah. webinar. So I really appreciate um, Kathleen, your time and your expertise. I mean, my goodness, it's it's just great to see the knowledge that you gain going through the SEMA program. Um, I appreciate everyone in the chat uh, going ahead and, and answering and making an interactive session. So this is fantastic. Um, please go ahead and um, put any questions you have into the chat. We are just gonna do a few minutes of q and I know we have literally 60 seconds left to wrap up our hour, but I'd love to do um, a, some q and if anyone has any questions for Kathleen. Gray and myself are gonna be available after today's call to go ahead and answer any questions you have about the program itself and your options. Kathleen mentioned our two education providers and just which, which one works best for your lifestyle as Kathleen mentioned. So feel free to reach out to us. I'm gonna share my screen here quickly just so you can get um, our contact information as well as um, the team over there at Chicago Booth, Rebecca, Monica, and Kathleen. And then I will go ahead and share um, Gray and I here. Um, here we are. Go ahead and take a screenshot of this. We'd be happy to help. Um, Gray, any questions coming into the chat that are relevant for today's call before we wrap up? Um, sure. There was one question about uh, scheduling the test after the class. Um, oh. So anybody I can didn't jump. See that. Oh, is that in the Q&A box? Oh, yeah, there's some coming in the Q&A as well. So I can um, answer that. Yeah, go, go for it. I think you should wait. Uh, so I would wait three weeks because there's a lot to a uh, lot to put together. Yep. Yeah, most advisors do report um, taking some time to to study after the exam or after the final executive yeah. education component. Um, so that that's great advice. Yeah. Joel has a question about waivers for the three year experience requirement. Well. <clears throat> 
I, I don't think I would call them waivers there. You can start SEMA with less than three years, uh, but in order to have a SEMA designation or certification after your name in your signature, your business cards, you do need to have those three years. So if say you start it in two, two and a half years, by the time you finish the SEMA, generally after six months or so, you'll, you'll probably have it by then, but you can start the program with less than three years. And you could literally start the program and do the program with no 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 desire to get the letters, right? Like if you right. wanted to, you could, if you just wanted the learning and you didn't really think that you needed the certification because that wasn't your field, you could still do this program, right? Absolutely. All right, cool. Yeah, because I think some people would like it as a summary of everything, even if they were using the material less than applying it, yeah. A question here about um, is waiting more about refreshing the earlier material in the program or doing the exam test prep. I think it's more about. Um, so when it, at Booth, what happens is we do twelve weeks, so we're doing everything sequentially. And what you all may not know is there's two aspects of all both programs. There's the workshop. I mean, there's the education program, which is broader than the certification exam, right? So you actually pass the work that you pass the education program but then the certification is kind of like a parallel track and so that gives you time to like strip out the stuff that you might have had to know for the education program but not need to know for the certification exam um so it's more about paul i would say getting fast um on these types of things so at booth we buy for you the wiley efficient learning which has thousands of test prep problems and um you know you will spend those three weeks just getting everything so that you can answer quickly everything. That's what I would wait for. Yeah. It's kind of like focusing. Yeah. Streamlining. Wonderful. Um, well, I don't think any have come in. Um, some really great uh, Q&A during the presentation. So again, thank you all for your um, interactive experience today on today's webinar. Kathleen, as always, um, we yeah, are so lucky you. to have you. And thank you so much for joining us. Everyone, um, feel free to reach out to Gray and I with any additional questions or the team there at Chicago Booth, and we will uh, see you next time. Thanks so much.